In the season premiere of Studio Inter, we'll be reviewing the Derby della Madonnina. We'll be doing a post-mortem on the Handanovic, De Frey, Inzaghi, Bastoni, Barella situation. We'll be predicting the season. We'll be previewing the upcoming games against Bayern Munich and Torino. This week's Moji, Moratti and Frog. And much, much more. Everything here on Studio Inter on elcentreinter.com. Benvenuti, bentornati to the season premiere of Studio Inter. Folks, it's been a minute. (laughs) I know it's been a minute, and I'm really sorry about that. There was a lot of things happening with the site that I had to prioritize. We've gone through so many changes, including an an ownership, uh, not an ownership change, but an ownership addition, um, which we were with... um, uh, Rocket Sports uh, entering into Semprinter, and that took so much time, there was so much to fix, and we've had the transfer window after that. But now we're back, we're back, and we're going to do this every week. So please forgive us for the uh, for for the for the little pause um, that and 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 for us not being here weekly like we always are. Uh, but normal so- service resumed, and we've got a jam packed. Uh, episode this this uh, this season premiere. I'm joined by the Semprinter.com preview writer, Mr. Mohamed Nasa. Hey, hey, hey. How's everyone? Hope uh, all is doing well and can't wait to get into the episodes. And we're also joined by Semprinter.com's weekly feature writer, Five Things We Learned from uh, Inter this week, Mr. Jake Smalley. Yeah, good evening. Really great to be back and uh, discussing all things Inter once again. And we're also joined by the editor of Dallas Magazine, the co-host of 77 Minutes in Heaven, our very own Reverend Mike, Mike Pellucci. I got to say, Nima, if you could extend some of these positive ownership changes to Inter too, that'd be amazing. I think we'd all go for a little positive ownership changes at Inter after the summer we just had. Yeah, um, we are going to talk about the summer. We're going to talk about the Mercato. We're going to give our ratings and all that, and we're going to prove. But we need to start at the Derby um, because it was not a nice thing to see. Um, and it was a game where I'm, I'm just going to explain how I see this game. I see a game where that starts fairly balanced, Inter and Milan both kind of feeling each other, you know, like like two boxers in the in the early ring in the in the early rounds, just kind of feeling each other, see where the other one is. Um, Inter score the f- draw first blood with, with an outstanding uh, piece of play by Lautaro Martinez, who we will discuss. I think he's never been better than... I, 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 he's never been better than he is right now. And he's doing this hold-up play, and, and his physique is, is, is... He's stronger than he's ever been. And, and, and he does something that I've never seen him do, um, holding up the ball like a beast and plays it off of Correa, who plays it behind uh, uh, to Brozovic, and who scores the goal. And then after that, Milan press, high, uh, pre, you know, raised their press, they press higher up, and Inter are completely dumbfounded. They don't know what to do, and they're lucky to go into the to the first half, into the interval, one all. Then everyone can see that changes need to be made, but Simone Inzaghi doesn't do any changes, and instead. By the 64th minute, when he makes three changes, Milan are three one up, and it's pretty much game over. And Inter are lucky, in my opinion, to lose this game only by three two. It could have ended with a if they had a if Milan were a little bit sharper in in in, in finishing, could have ended four five one, but it didn't. Um, and I wanted to see, I want to I want to turn to you, Mo. Um, I'm like. I'm struggling to find anything positive with this game other than that Simon Inzaghi's substitutions were positive in that they absolutely changed the game. Yeah, I think uh, you're right there. I think uh, the positivity is uh, the game started correctly. Inzaghi uh, started off well. Uh, I think uh, the mid-game management, mid-game, like the second act of the match management still seems to elude him. Uh, and whereas uh, you know he's been sort of uh, famous for uh, misjudging many of his uh, act three substitutions, I think in the last couple of games he's uh, managed to do that quite well with Lautaro uh, coming in and scoring a great goal uh, last weekend. I think uh, or Zeko, I can't remember now. It's all uh, a blur. 
And then, uh, and then, like you said, the, the final act of uh, the derby was was pretty much all Inter. And again, you know, so I, it, it's. I mean, clearly there are structural flaws in this in, in the side. Uh, there's no denying that. And clearly, Inzaghi uh, still needs to take a step up or two. But I think the positive. There are silver linings to this uh, derby. I think uh, Inter Inter were not too far away from taking not only a point but all three points from this match. Uh, you know, save for a few of those errors, which I'm sure we're going to quite late. So yeah, my, the, the 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 positive things I draw out of this game is that the team lined up well. I think the first half, at least the beginning, the beginning of the first half, was very well managed, and I think the the reaction to going to the goals behind was very very strong and i think uh mike i call him that because i can't I, for the life of me pronounce like get the phonetics right uh, the milan goalkeeper save for his heroics inter should have or could have uh, come out to, with more than just uh zero points from this match uh, it's it's mike Magnon, like filet mignon <laughs> i mean i guess that's how i've been taught that uh, it's supposed to... as, a, as a matter of fact i was just talking to my french friend earlier today and he's like it's not it's mignon so Menion. it's a very Menion. weird menu. So it's a, not a manion, it's a menu. Menion, make menion. Okay, menu. I Menion. like the menion idea only because that guy is the top of the line in the league and we are starting chuck steak and goal. So <laughs> it's, it's real fitting. <laughs> Look, Mike, um, I, I want to hear your overall thoughts because we need to get into this uh, situation. We need to discuss Stefan de Frey and, and Handanovic. But, but I want to hear what you have to say. I mean, my main thinking, I think you guys hit the nail on the head. It really felt like a microcosm of everything that when Inter lose and have lost to the Inzaghi era, I think in some ways it comes down to one of three things. And we saw all three, right? We saw questionable substitution management from Simone Inzaghi. We saw uh, a defensive meltdown uh, from DeVry, but really the defense has been getting worse the last two years. That you know, it isn't, and I, I don't think we expect a Conte defense under Inzaghi, right? Inzaghi has different strengths as a manager, but it doesn't change the fact that the defense was worse last year than it was two seasons ago. And it's very early days yet, but it definitely looks worse this year than it did last year. And then the last thing, uh, on the second goal especially, is just more Samir Handanovic just uh, being a statue in net. And I think, gosh, since the Inzaghi era started, if you look at probably the points that drop, more often than not, it, it comes down to one of those three things. I suppose you know, you know somebody else would say, hey, it's because Inter left a lot of chances on the board last year not having a clinical striker, which is definitely true. The good news is I between Lataro's progression and Lukaku being back, I don't think we're going to have to worry about that quite as much as the season goes on. I'm really not concerned there. Uh, but I'm definitely concerned about these three issues for different reasons. And we saw them all on the same day. And they all rear their head at once in one particularly awful half an hour, right? I mean, it's all you flat out said. They stopped playing for half an hour. And uh, I'm sorry, but if your players aren't playing for half an hour, that that's on you. That's you as the manager. Because so help me, we did not see that with Antonio Conte. Conte would put the fear of God in these guys if they try to think about doing something like that. So it was just the worst of all worlds at once, and it just made for a pretty miserable experience all the way around. Mm, absolutely. Uh, Jake, what are your thoughts? Because I want to get into the Stefan de Frey and Samir Handanovic thing, because uh, I see a lot of similarities there. But yeah. yeah. I think, I think maybe we've not touched on quite as much is the mentality of the two teams was so almost polar opposites. I felt watching the game at part, so there were some positive moments. That the inter team almost looks a little stale, as if in some ways it's obviously peaked already. Maybe is it coming towards the end of a cycle a little bit? Whereas you look at Milan's team and they're only going to push on stronger. Some of those younger players are going to get better all the time. Uh, I think Rafael Leal's role in the game is obviously something that's going to need to be highlighted a little bit more as well. A lot of defenders get a little bit worried when he starts running at them, but the manner in which De Vrij defended particularly against him, was concerning. Um, but obviously, as a manager, you'd be looking forward to that, thinking, well, that's something that we're going to have to deal with. And you're preparing a little bit better. I think what concerns me the most is looking around the team and looking at all the players who played in that game. How many of them put in a 7 or an 8 out of 10 performance? You just mentioned Nima Lautaro this year. Looks like he's really come on even further. And that's really promising. And like you just said, Mike, I think in terms of the attacking side of the team, 
we're only going to see positives in that part of the season goes on, especially when they play the lower sides, like we did when they played against Spezia. But it's this big game management that the manager really struggles to sort of excel in. And it, we saw it all last year and it's continuing this year. And that makes me think that this could potentially maybe be the last season in charge that we see with Simone Inzaghi. Or is it the fact maybe that the players have just sort of peaked? Maybe they're a bit fed up as well. You know, this question marks over some of their futures. They've seen some of the better players be sold off. They've seen them miss out on key targets. There's a lot to discuss. I won't get too far into it, but I think it raised a number of issues for me about where the club's going in terms of on the pitch and off it for me. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Jake, because I think the I mean the derby is you know every everyone saw it, so you know it is what it is. Um, the blackouts, as Simon Inzaghi called, called it. Um, I, I we will talk about. I, I I think with Simon Inzaghi, I think it's very simply this. I want to go on the record and say this. I think he prepared a preseason playing, pre- waiting for Bremer and Milenkovic to come in, and that he was going to play with a higher defensive line and also a midfield and an attacking line that adapts to that. Um, and he prepared the entire preseason with that, and then none of them came, and he's got the same same defense that he's had before. And he's there is a lack of balance between. So he's moved the defensive line back again, but the midfield hasn't adapted fully, um, and they look a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and I think that's the main reason why things are why they switch off. Because I think whenever Inter's midfield and, and the defense, I mean, right now you could, I, I don't the 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 Grand Canyon of distance uh, between the defensive line and the midfield every time Inter is in transition and lose the ball. And that's never where it's been before. They're very long. The it's like three separate teams, but, um, and, and I think when, when you have six against three and Rafael Leao gets to come with, come and come and beat you for pace, he'll, he'll do win 10 times out of 10 against mostly every, pretty much every defender in the world. But that, that's, that's just a tactical aspect of this game. I do want to talk because I remember on this podcast before a little break um, in 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 March or, or in February even I mean even the season before that uh, when we won the Scudetto I was on this podcast talking about if we weren't beginning to see the seeds of a Samir Handanovic 2.0 decline with Stefan de Frey and I don't know why if it's a physical thing I don't think it is or if it's a mental thing or whatever it is. It, I think I think that 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 discussion has been comfortably put to bed. He he is clearly that it's it is a Handanovic 2.0. And what do I mean by Handanovic 2.0? I I've always my view on Handanovic has always been that Samir Handanovic, when he was bought in 2012 until 2018 19 when he was appointed and named the best goalkeeper in the Serie A, is without a doubt was was one of the few, if not only, shining lights together with Mauro Icardi in a decade of misery at Inter, the likes of which the club, well, it, it has never really seen in its history. Um, and I think, I know a lot of people criticise him for not moving. I find that, I find those criticisms during that period, 2012 to 2019, to be, well, quite silly because, you know, it's it's not, He's a, he's a, he's an elite he's an elite athlete. This notion of him not throwing himself as if to imply that he doesn't care enough and doesn't want to save it is frankly ludicrous. Um, so I don't want to dwell too much on that nonsense because to me that's just the kind of social media bullshit that we see everywhere and we don't need to spend time on it. But my my the thing that I do where I, where I am and where I'm at with Handanovic is that his strength has always been his reflexes. His his weakness has always been his positioning. And when you have a decline like he's had since he was named the best goalkeeper in, in the Serie A by both the Italian Fo- Footballers Association and the league in 2018-2019 season after that, then what happens is the good things that he was good at become bad, mediocre. The things that he was bad at are at the very, uh, are, are either, <laughs> are show, are either at the same level or have, also gone from bad to worse and it's a it's a it's it's a con it's it's um it becomes like the perfect storm that it you know exponentially everything gets worse over time and now i mean in in the context of the milan game i want to be absolutely clear i don't think he did anything i don't think he did a howler in either one of these uh, in for either one of the goals but the issue is that 
he a, a world class goalkeeper. The, all the top clubs have world class goalkeepers. The ones who make the impossible saves. The ones who make the saves that you, you know, not the normal saves, but the very good to great saves. Handanovic doesn't make those saves anymore, and that's why pretty much every single shot on target is a goal now, because the finishing is so good in 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 world football generally that. You need to you need to be well unless you are top class you you, you you're going to concede um, and Inter don't get many shots at them um, and when it, the ones that they do get at them uh, are, are 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 always it's it's it, the, the finishes are of such high quality that he can't save them, that that he doesn't he seems unable to save them what I mean by that is look at Mike Mignon the Chalanoglu save. The Lautaro header. That's what I mean. Handanovic used to make those saves. He doesn't make those saves anymore. And that's why, and that's not his fault. As you said also last season, Mike, brilliantly in your, in a, in a, in a, in, in a long monologue you had about this, that look, this is the club's fault, not, my, not Ham, Samir Handanovic's fault. And, right. yeah. and, and we're seeing the same thing now with Stefan de Frey. I do not want to see this club extend with Stefan de Frey. He is clearly past it. The, 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 uh, wh- and why do I say that? Because and people could say, okay, what about Alessandro Bastoni? What about Nicolo Barella? Yeah, but Nicolo Barella and Alessandro Bastoni, Bastoni is only 23 years old. I think a lot of things with Bastoni was covered by a fantastic Ivan Perisic for two, three years when he came up through the ranks and showed who he was. He's still a player that's learning and developing. At, he's only 23 years old, and he's, and he's won um, so many titles. We have to remember that he's still young and he's still going to develop. And I think the defensive side of his game is something he will need to develop. As for Barella, he was burned out by Conte and the Euros, and last season was very, 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 very inconsistent. And so this continues into this season. But it's, I think with him, it's more a mental thing as well, because he was the man of the match against Cremonese. And then he pulls up the worst performance in his career. So I'm not, to me, that's, that's more of a mental thing. But Stefan de Frey has, is, 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 uh, was scared of Rafael Leao. He, he's, he, I mean, the first goal, yes, Chalanoglu should have looked up before making that pass. But Stefan de Frey should be there. He should meet the ball. I mean, at least two goals that are completely on him to go with the other goals in the derby in February, which he also, I mean, he got turned by Olivier Giroud for crying out loud. And, and again, he's not close enough to Olivier Giroud this time around either. For for this for for his goal, I mean it's it's just I, I just see the same thing, and then obviously with a settlement agreement, Inter are almost forced to to sign to extend with with Stefan de Frey because there's no other <laughs> there's no other central defender out there who 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 is of a of his of, of you know the quality needed to replace him. Akanji was, but he he's he's at Man City now. Milenkovic was, but he extended. I mean. It's it really is looking like like the the Handanovic situation repeated time and time uh, repeated over again, and I can't blame the players. I, I really can't. Right. I mean, Mike, yeah. Mike, Mike. Let me know. Yeah. We'll, we'll well, and I it's I think it's very good that you're talking about these two things in concert because they are related, right? Handanovic, like you said, until really nineteen was a phenomenal keeper. And Inter won the Scudetto basically in spite of him. But it worked because at the time, the back line was at the height of its power, Stefan de Vrij included. It worked because you could have a liability in net if you just don't allow shots on net. What you can't have is a liability on net while you're allowing a lot of shots on net because one of your three center backs is just a black hole now. And I'm with you that, you know, you and I both on this podcast have consistently said this isn't Samir Adonovic's fault, okay? The club, you know, the club didn't sign someone for a very long time. He's out there doing his best. Anybody who actually thought that, and there was a school of thought for a long time that, oh, maybe Radu could do better. No, 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 never. Uh, <laughs> Can well I remember that? And I was consistently against that. And I think after yeah. what happened against Bologna, we we can put that to bed. No, well, and, and especially what's happened early in the season with you know with him alone this year, right? Uh, but here's the thing, and this is this is the one great hope that I have. If you if you are a believer that this team can win the league. There is one hope now, and his name is Andre Onana. Because what Andre Onana, you know, we should have the Andre Onana talk. Andre Onana, pre-doping suspension, looked like the best young keeper in the world alongside Gianluigi Donnarumma. And 
there will be people who, if you haven't researched what actually happened, uh, he didn't really dope. He basically took a supplement by mistake. Even the people who suspended him admitted that this was a mistake. This wasn't something that he was doing and being shady about, right? We have no reason to believe this is performance enhancing. Uh, before the suspension, he was incredible. He took Ajax to the Champions League semifinals. He was phenomenal. Uh, he comes back, la- you know, he comes back midway through last year after not being allowed to train with his club for a long time. He looks very erratic. Uh, and I say all this to say you can believe he is the world class guy from a few years ago, and he could still be that person since he's only 25. You can believe that he might be a little more error prone now, uh, which is what he's looked like since the start of 2022. What I do know is this. Andre Anana, even if he makes mistakes, will also do things that will stop shots, that will save shots. And that's before the distribution, which is legitimately fantastic. Andre Anana is your best chance, if you are Inter, at saving some goals. Because Stefan de Vrij's body isn't coming back, right? This is the same thing as the Handanovic deal. It's over. It's done. I was hoping it wouldn't get to this point. But once you, once you get past it physically like that, it's not turning around. So if you have... A problem at center back, and there is no solution on this roster. I'm sorry, but Francesco Cherubi, while he's better than Andrea Vernoke, is not going to save this club's back line. You might have a solution in that. And before it was, okay, let's not blame anybody but management because management didn't sign someone, right? And Zaghi did what he had to do with Samir Handanovic. Well, now, every week that goes by where we don't see at least some of Andrea Nana just to get his feet wet, this becomes a point the finger at Simone Anzaghi's situation. Because the fact that he wasn't out there against Cremonese is unbelievable. I couldn't believe that they wouldn't give him a shot in that match. And it does make you wonder because Anzaghi going back to Lazio was the sort of guy who likes to ride one keeper. And Anzaghi, to his credit, right, what did we see last year? Anzaghi was slow to make some changes to his lineup. By the end of the year, he eventually figured it out, right? Start last year, Andre, uh, Alessandro Bastoni wasn't actually starting a lot uh, at left center back. That got corrected over the year. He didn't really know how to use Hakan Chalanoglu. That got corrected by mid-year. He waited too late uh, to use Joaquin Correa as a spark. Well, toward the stretch run, Joaquin Correa was playing more. And at the start of this year, we're seeing a little bit of they almost started Jekyll in the Derby, uh, and you know it's you can't really play out in Jekyll for ninety minutes anymore. That's just not a very good idea. To his credit, he started Correa, who had a good moment of brilliance before he disappeared. So Inzaghi figures things out eventually, and I think the story that is going to define a lot of this interseason is going to be at what point does he get Onana in net? Because the more time he wastes, the more points Inter will drop because you cannot play with a fractured back line and a fractured keeper. And I'm not claiming to know which Andre Anana is showing up. What I am claiming is that it's going to be better on balance, and it gives you more of a chance than what Samir Handanovic does. Because Mike Magnan wasn't just the difference in this match. Mike Magnan was the difference last season. All right? I know Liao was the player of the season. I know Sandro Tonali came on late. But Mike Magnan is the best player at AC Milan. Mike Magnan wins matches the way Samir Handanovic did 10 years ago. Andre Anana has a chance to be that guy. And if you're enter with what this team is, you owe it to yourself to find out if he can be because the status quo does not work. And I, and frankly, look, if Samir Andonovich didn't have the armband, I don't think we'd even be waiting this long. I think he probably would play right now. I get that there are leadership politics have to be sorted out, but we are, they're going to start losing more points, whether it's directly due to Handanovic errors or di- because Handanovic can't clean up Stefan de Vrij errors. They will drop more points every week that Handanovic is there and de Vrij is there. So they need to play on Nana. They need to do it soon. And I just hope we're not in some situation where we're, on, we're doing the podcast around Christmas and we're all wondering why the hell they won't play this keeper that they saw in a Bosman for big money. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, um, no, no, Mo, what, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, where are you on all this? Well, I mean, uh, first things first, I think, uh, I have to correct, stand corrected that, uh, the Friday last year when you, uh, when you rang those alarm bells that you spoke of earlier, I was, uh, quite uh, reticent to, uh, believe that, uh, he was in, uh, you know, uh, one, one way, uh, decline. But uh, it clearly is an issue at the moment, so uh, and it doesn't look like he's coming back. I really, I really liked your analysis. I hadn't thought of that at all. That, uh, the idea that uh, Inzaghi had been uh, planning his preseason on a higher back line and uh, the guys uh, remaining at the club and uh, not bringing in uh, Bremer or Milenkovic has led to this uh, issue because it, it, 
it does explain quite a bit. I also like the fact that uh, the usually uh, pessimistic uh, Reverend Mike has, uh, you know, advertently or inadvertently been quite <laughs> an optimist because I, 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 I agree that the team is strong. It's better than last year in many ways, except at the back. And like you say, Mike, it's in Inzaghi's hand now. And I think uh, the kind of pressure that he's under at the moment from the fans and from the press, realizing just, uh, you know, I mean, this whole head-to-head -head against the club, uh, determining your final position in the season, it's, it's no joke when you come up against the big teams. You need, you need to pick up points. You cannot, uh, you know, you cannot uh, drop uh, games just like that. So uh, with, with Roma coming up after the, after the break, I think it's very important uh, for Inzaghi to, you know, take a page out of the Ten Hag's playbook and see what needs to be done. Bench Maguire, the captain, that's fine. 80 million, 85 million pounds, that's not the point at the moment. And, and he doesn't even have as much, uh, you know, uh, commercial baggage with the Handanovic. We know that uh, Onana has been brought into replacement. So, start the replacement over the international break uh, and, um, and, and then and then do the transition there, you know. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I think ultimately this is going to be a good season. I think my, my biggest question mark has always been Inzaghi, whether Inzaghi has the killer instinct to uh, win a league, win a title uh, from all the way from A to Z or not. But since you, the pessimists, seem to, you know, believe that he's not um, as, as big of an issue, then I guess... Our, our, our Venn diagram of, of concerns about winter, <laughs> you know, converge sufficiently when there is a scenario where we do win the league. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's, that's where I said. I absolutely love that. That was brilliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that diagram. Um, yeah, no, no, look, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do think that Simon Inzaghi is he's a young coach. I think he, he needs time. And and people always whinge about, oh, you need to give young coaches and young players a chance. Well, Inter have now. They've given a young coach a chance. Um, they, they, they they brought in young Belanova and Aslani are young players. Uh, it's going to take time. And, and I hope that, you know, hopefully he sees, and I think he will, um, because people, you know, people talk about, oh, he didn't play Pedro Neto when he was at Lazio, or he doesn't like youth at Lazio. Well, that's not entirely true either, because Sergei Milinkovic Savic was hardly a experienced superstar when he joined Lazio, and he became one under 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 Simone Inzaghi. And and, and with all, you know, P Pedro Neto was a kid back then, and and he's kind of just coming to his own now in the Premier League at Wolverhampton now. I think it's... I, I don't like making sweeping statements. This is Simone Inzaghi. We're not talking about Max Allegri here. You know, it's, it's the same thing with Antonio Conte. For all the criticisms I had against him, this notion that he never played youth is complete nonsense, because if they're good enough, he'll play them. And I think Simone is the same way. If they're good enough, he will play them. Um, I think the problem with Handanovic is uh, with the Handanovic situation is because exactly as Mike Mike pointed to, he's also the team's bloody captain, and and that is just a that that is just the the icing on the on top, like that is the the, the polished turd on top of the shit cake that Inter have baked for themselves, and it's it's it, because it's just like with with France the national team with Mike Mignon. Being not being not starting because Hugo Lloris is the captain, you know that it's great to make your goalkeeper the captain, but it's also important to be able to, the way Juve did when Buffon was the captain, they benched him when he wasn't good enough, you know, and then obviously Buffon went to PSG and and they were you know they, they bought Chesney for a season. I don't think that Inter can afford to to do that. They need to start Andre Onana now. Um, Samir Andanovic. Again, as I said, I don't share this notion that he's always been mediocre, as some people have been saying. Uh, I don't share this notion at all. I think when he was at that's revisionist peak, history. Of, I mean, that's the worst kind of revisionist history. Like you said, yeah. I mean, Handanovic and Icardi were the team for a good half decade, and Samir was longer than that. That's anybody who forgets that needs to stop talking. Like he was amazing, yes. and they wasted his best years, and that's not on him. Exactly. The, the, that, that's exactly my point. I do think that he's always had, like all goalkeepers, have strengths and deficiencies. I think his has always been his uh, his positioning. The problem is that now when his reflexes don't... Hey, uh, sorry, sorry, Nima. I just want to ask uh, 
what uh, what rules does the new potential ownership of uh, Simply Inter uh, uh, <laughs> enforce in terms of like uh, swearing and, and uh, <laughs> language on the podcast? No, no, you can, you can, you can you don't, no. It's just that we don't want to be given in, like a bad rating on on iOS and, and you know on all these other platforms like Spotify and all that. All right, can, can, can we just uh, move off from the Handanovic not riding uh, parade and and you know? All right, we know you love Handanovic, but the guys. Are no, I don't now. love Handanovic. No, I don't like. I don't love Handanovic. I just don't like the the revisionist history, as Mike said. I just think it's an it's dishonest to say that he's always been mediocre. To say that he's never been this, that, or the other. When when that's clearly not true. I think I think it's unfair to judge him on this. What we're seeing right now. Yeah. But, no. No. I agree. That that Mancini season, he was uh, exceptional. Yeah. Exceptional. I mean. Uh, and, and and I also Spalletti, eighteen nineteen, when he was when he was named the the best co- best goalkeeper in the Serie. I mean, he, he look. My point is simply this: that it's a very complex situation with Handanovic. And now I get that he's ruining his legacy uh, because he's not going to go to see Moninzaghi, as I, some people seem to think and uh, <laughs> expect of him, and say, "Yeah, coach, don't play me." What athlete would do that? I mean, it's it, it's just insane. Of course he's not going to do that. It's Simone Inzaghi who has to do it. And you all know that I, if we're talking about uh, D-riding, uh, I mean, you've heard me talk about Simone Inzaghi since 2017. Him I actually really believe in. And and I'm not entirely, I'm, I'm not, I'm not giving up on him. I'm not criticizing his ability, but I am, I, it's time for him to deliver and, and show that he can be a coach at a big club who can handle making tough decisions and benching players that are past it and and that there are there are no such thing as untouchables and stuff like that that takes a big coach a big manager like Mourinho did with Ike Casillas at Real Madrid granted it only cost him his job but he did it and he and he was right or or when when you know we've seen we've seen examples of this in the past with other big managers who've who've come come in and and benched big name players. Simone has to do that now, and he has to do it with with Stefan de Frey as well. He just has to. That's the only thing. Um, uh, Jake, you've been awfully quiet. Well, what's your two cents on all this? I think the goalkeeper situation is quite straightforward, given that you've got a more than adequate replacement sat on the bench. I think my worry. With Stefan de Vrij, how you restructure the defence. I don't like Federico Di Marco playing left sided centre half. You can't really then move Bastoni and Scuniar around. I think if I'm going to drop de Vrij, I maybe bring in D'Ambrosio back in, or even Darmian plays a right sided centre back, moving Scuniar into the middle and playing Bastoni. I suppose you could do that. Uh, I think it's a shame. I've got a lot of time for Handanovic. I've always rated him as goalkeeper, but it's it's really obvious in anybody who's watched football for a prolonged period of time can see that certain players, once they get to a certain stage in their career, just can't perform anymore. And genuinely, I watch into in a big game now, and I, a shot goes in, I wait for it to hit the back of the net, and I watch yeah. the replay, and I'm like, yeah. what is he doing? He's, 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 his legs are made out of like glue. He, he can't move the same. It, and it's a physical deficiency, you know, the same as what Mike was saying with De Vrij. So it, it's pretty straightforward, but we, we know what the big picture is. You know, we, we thought maybe two years or so ago, under Conte, into making a bit more of a revival, winning the league, pushing forward. Finances have hindered them, so they've not prepared adequately. Um, and they don't really have the same quality to replace. It's not like a four, three, four year ago, Stefan de Vrij sat on the bench waiting to come in. It's, it is going to be hard. And that does make you feel a bit pessimistic towards this season ahead. But I think at the moment, I'm probably considering playing Scudia in the middle and bringing Dan Barrels, maybe Darmian in as that extra centre-back. I mean, maybe Acherbi, but no. Nah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I'd play Acherbi in the middle uh, and, and Skriniar and, and either, you know, and, and, and play Darmian to the, as a left centre-back or because or, I agree, I think Di Marco is, is not a left centre-back. He should be a wing-back. Like, like let's stop this, this, this madness before we ruin another player. Um Right. Um, let's um, let's talk about the um, the the what's. I mean, just quickly. Um, the the you kind of touched on already, Jake. So I want to start with you. Um, what do you think about um, the? I mean, it, just quickly, the mercato. What rating do you give? And uh, what, what what like what what rating do you give and why? I want to go to everyone. I'll start with you, Jake. I think it's really hard. I think there's 
there's been some real positives. Uh, I like the signing of Aslani. I think he's a good player. Um, I don't even mind Mkhitaryan coming in too much. You know, obviously Lukaku's a good one. Whether that season at Chelsea's still hanging over a little bit, obviously he's injured at the moment. Whether in Zoya can get the same amount as what Conte did uh, raises a question. But for me, missing out on Bremer is huge. The defence is weaker, as we just keep discussing. Um, I think I'd give it a six, six and a half. I think it could have been better. Um, but the signings that were made, I'm not too disappointed with any of them, any of them as such. Mm. Mo, what uh, signing do you give? Yeah, uh, what, rate, uh, what rating do you give? I, I, I'm, uh, I would say uh, seven, seven and a half. I think uh, uh, we we tend to forget uh, how strong or how good the outgoing Mercat was. Uh, we did shed a lot of uh, dead weight. Uh, I think uh, you know the the one the one maybe a seven not a seven and a half because uh, Chad be signing. You know, I really dislike that fellow. I, despite respect, all the respect <laughs> for his you know uh, story of. Uh, Overcoming his health issues and returning as a top player, so on and so forth. But he just uh, he, he 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 doesn't sit well with me. Uh, so I think yeah, a seven because of the the problems we're currently seeing in defense that we had known about pretty much all summer. You know, Bremer, 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 and then Milenkovic, Milenkovic, and then nothing, and then Acerbi. You know, so so I think that they, they dropped at least a half point there. But I think the people who did eventually come in. Like you said, you know, uh, Seranova, Aslani, Nana, Lukaku, Mikatian, utility uh, forward uh, last 15 minutes when necessary. So not a not a bad signing. We kept uh, Skriniar, we kept uh, Lautaro. There was talks of Lautaro leaving. We kept Rozovic, still the, probably the best central midfield in the league, the best uh, attacking duo in the league. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a seven. Yeah, seven, seven and a half, seven and a half. I've stalked myself into uh, giving the re- returning that half point. <laughs> Mike, what about you? What rating? I'll split the difference between the guys. I, I, I'll say a solid seven. I, I think it's not as much what they did. You know, it's really just how everything went down because Inter made this blitz in the first three weeks of the Mercato. They did most of their business then. And, you know, as Mo said, a lot of the moves we thought were coming did not happen. I think if, you know, if the order of this were reversed of, okay, Inter missed out on things, but here's how they rallied towards the finish line and this is what they did, we might be viewing this differently. Because I had said all last year, this year's Inter team will be more talented than last year's. And I don't know how that's not true, even losing Ivan Perisic, right? There was no midfield depth at all last year. And now they have a guy in uh, Aslani who I think we're all excited about as a prospect, but also Henrik Mkhitaryan can still play, right? This isn't a, a Vidal thing where he comes in and it's pretty clear his legs are gone. Mkhitaryan showed uh, even just in these snippets he's played so far, he still has it. He was one of Roma's best players last year. Yeah. We talked about Onana. If they play him, he'll be an upgrading goal. Uh, I don't know if Lukaku is going to be the guy who won the league, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be better than what he was last year. And that guy is a more clinical goal scorer than anyone Inter have had. And uh, he can take penalties. That's going to be great. So you have that. You have a young prospect of Bellanova, who I, I think is a project, but at least they have a young, exciting body there versus let's just get a guy in a Bosman. Considering the constraints that Beppe Morata and his team are working with, it's remarkable. I mean, this team spent what? 16 million euros net it's embarrassing that it's come to that but and if you look at the circumstances it's easy to get mad but in pure this is what they added this is what the roster looks like compared to last year and this is how good Beppe Marotta is at his job I think you got to say at least a seven no I think seven for sure um every single player that came in was better than the player they replaced Lukaku's better than Caicedo Onana's better than Radu Acerbi's better than Ranocchia um, you know, uh, Mkhitaryan and, and Aslani are better than Vecino and Vidal, at least in this system. Um, the only downgrade was was obviously Ivan Perisic, but I think it was the right time to let him go because I think he had the best career of, season of his career then, and and I think he uh, I, he would not be doing the same thing now at Inter, and you can see he's not doing it at, at Spurs either. But he's a he's a good um, no, I, I think it's a solid seven. Um, I I just want to go on the record and say that. I think Lautaro Martinez is going to be Inter's top goal scorer, even though the fact that Romelu Lukaku takes the penalties for Inter. I think Romelu, I think now Lautaro Martinez, and we saw it against Spezia as well, 
he uh, towards the end of last season he he did something that I never thought he would become he would do or become and that is to become a killer in the box I always saw him as a more nine and a half like a seconda punta uh, nine something like that but towards the end, end of last season he he proved that he could be he's, he's he's developed that aspect of him of his of his game becoming a killer in the box and now he's worked on his physique uh, as well and his strength as we've seen so far against Spezia and also in the derby I think it was Tomori who couldn't get near him or Kalulu I can't remember um, they couldn't get near him um, and he hold, holds off the ball and, and if he can I mean if he does that as well then then he's a complete striker he is a world-class player uh, probably Inter's only world-class player um, but also important to have him so no I I, I agree I, th- I think seven is is where we are um, as for the predictions for the for the Serie A I think Inter will win I think Milan will come second I think Juve will come third and I think Napoli will come fourth Roma fifth Lazio sixth and Atalanta seventh uh, what about you uh, Mo what, what are your predictions I've said it from the beginning it in uh, in my heart of hearts, I really, I still think this Milan team is a bit overrated. Uh, I think uh, playing it in the Champions League, uh, top of their group, uh, they probably progress through the group. It's going to give them problems. Uh, their depth isn't there, experience isn't there. So I think here's my hot take: uh, Milan are going to struggle to finish fourth. I think Inter are going to win. I think Napoli are going to come second. I think it's a uh, Probably Roma in third with uh, Mourinho on fire, and then a uh, uh, fight between uh, Juve and uh, Milan for fourth place. That's uh, oh. that's where I start. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Okay. It's a good season, man. I think it's going to be a great season. <laughs> okay, but we, we really need to clip clip those and and, and look back at them um, at the end of the season because we always forget to do that. We really need yeah, to. Yeah, uh, we do. We do. Um, these, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm writing them all or, down. Or tweet them. Yeah, tweet. Meet them on 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 the, uh, on the account or something, yeah, with a, yeah. so that we have a record, Absolutely. easy to go to record. No, no, I will, As the I'm, guy who did not have Milan making the Champions League last year, I say we don't revisit any of these predictions. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what 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 are your what's your top seven, Mike? So I from from our non-American listeners, uh, I live in Dallas, Texas, which is home to the world's most popular American football team, the Dallas Cowboys. And what the Dallas Cowboys are is uh, a team that has a lot of history and that used to be the standard bearer of the National Football League. And for the last quarter century, it doesn't win anything. And they don't win anything, not because of talent, because there have been years where they have some of the best teams in the NFL. They don't win because something about the infrastructure dooms them every time. And we don't have to get into why, but I have found myself thinking about that a lot with this team with Inter because I I was the person I'm with Mo all last year I thought that Milan team was overrated over and over again I thought they were and I get why Inter didn't win for personnel reasons but I still thought that was our title to lose and we lost it but I go into this year and maybe it's coming off the derby and I, what we watched but I just have this awful feeling that even though Inter on paper have the best team and for the record they have the best team as far as I'm concerned, even with Stefan Navrai declining, I think this is the best team in the league. But I just wonder if the instability and the upheaval is going to cost them another title because of, I, 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 I think, Nima's theory about how Simone prepared, assuming the defense will look like one thing and it's totally different, you know, I, that'll, that'll fix itself in time, right? In a couple months, I don't think that's going to be an issue for how we play. But how many points do you drop before that? How many points do you drop before they commit to Andre and Anna? Because I think sometime this year they probably will have to. Otherwise, if they don't, then they really will not come close to winning. I just worry that between stuff like that, between this team looking so fragile mentally, or not fragile mentally, but just the chaos of this ownership just not investing anymore, not caring, I just worry that they are going to lose because the infrastructure will doom the talent on the field. So I have Inter, and I hope I'm wrong. I've got Inter third. Uh... I think Milan will win again, not because they're better, but because Milan just seem to have some sort of stability. They seem to win these matches that Inter have not been winning since Christmas last year. They just, they're not the most talented, but they get the most out of what they have. And their ownership situation is about to be a little more stable. Uh, I think some, I, I think it might be Napoli. Second, uh, I can't decide if Napoli, what the order of Napoli, Inter, and Juve will be, but that is my two through four. 
Uh, then I will say Roma, Lazio, Atalanta. You know, Nima said on the fantastic Italian football podcast that he's on that it's the Seven Sisters this year, and I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I cannot see a world in which those seven teams are not one through seven in some order. But yeah, I hope I'm wrong, but I just really think that the stuff that isn't on the pitch will just cost Inter just enough again, and we will have two consecutive years of seasons that we should have won the league and we didn't, and that's infuriating. Mm, for sure, especially with the uh, with the settlement agreement and I think Dzeko's uh, contract expiring, Lukaku only being on a loan, uh, and Stefan de Frey and Milan Skriniar are on expiring contracts, and As- Alessandro Bastoni's contract expiring 2024, Samir Handanovic contract expiring, Danilo D'Ambrosi's contract expiring. Anyway, I don't want to depress people. Anyway, uh, Jake, um, what, what, what's your um, top seven? Well, after you've nearly depressed me into throwing <laughs> up on the window, uh, to be honest, I can't disagree with anything that Mike said. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I, I said a number of times last season that I thought Inter were better than Milan. And, you know, when I went to the Copertelli semi final, I watched Inter beat them 3 0. I thought Inter have proven that they are a better team. But over the course of the season, in terms of dropping points, I, I think Inter have already proved this year that they can drop points. You know, they've only played two difficult fixtures and they've lost them both. So, uh, I think Milan will win the league this season. I, it hurts me to say it. I'm sorry, Mo, I'm not saying it, you know, for any other reason. than I, I just believe that they had the rub of the green. You know, watching it last season, that game late against Lazio, when Tenoli scored, things like that. It seems like they're going to carry that into this season. Uh, I think Napoli will finish second. The, the Georgian boy whose name I keep getting wrong and I can't pronounce um, is unbelievable. I think... Aussie men, if he can stay fit for a full season, I think they'll finish second. Uh, I think Inter will finish third, uh, Roma fourth to finish off the top four. And Juve finishing fifth, I think probably seven sisters again. One tip that I think might break into that is Torino. I love Torino's sort of recruitment this summer. I really like the saying of Vlasic, he scored again tonight. And, uh, Ivan Juric is, for me, probably one of the best managers in the league. So uh, as, as far as we're concerned, I don't see Inter retaining that Scudetto away from their uh, cross-town rivals, sadly. Mm, God, horrible. Um, yeah, uh, OK. Um, so, speaking of... Um, we, we, we play Bayern Munich in uh, on, on Wednesday in the Champions League, and we... Uh, and then and then Torino... Um, sorry, yeah, it's, yeah, it is Torino, isn't it? Uh, on, on the weekend. Um, I... Um, <laughs> I I just uh, got to say I I don't see any chance they Inter beat Bayern Munich maybe a draw but I don't see it I see a three 0 comfortable win and then against Torino I think it's going to be gritty I think it's going to be difficult but I think Inter Inter will win one 0 What about you Mo? Yeah no very difficult to predict predict the uh, Bayern game um, like. Uh... I, Bayern are an unknown quantity in and of themselves. You know, it's the it's the post Lewandowski era. They're uh, super hot one game. They're not so hot the next game. So I think uh, I think if there's a time to face Bayern in the last you know three three seasons or so, maybe this is it. Um, I think the biggest problem is probably Sadio Mane coming up uh, coming up against either Di Marco on the left flank or or. Uh, you know, I don't know who else would be playing up against them. Uh, you spoke about Bastoni being covered by Perisic. Uh, we don't know how that's going to affect the defense. But it's going to be a good game. Uh, let's continue the positivity train and say a nice 1-1 draw. Because I think any the team between Barca and, and Inter who take points off of Bayern will be the team that go through. The most points you take off of Bayern. So mm. uh, let's say it's a nice uh, 1-1 or 2-2 uh, high scoring or scoring draw. Uh, because we probably won't be able to keep the, uh, a clean sheet for to save our lives. <laughs> against <laughs> no. Torino, yeah, against Torino, uh, a comfortable, uh, a comfortable, yeah, a straightforward but hardworking two-one. Mm, fair enough, um, Mike. Yeah, man. Of all the positive things, the most put of this podcast, getting a point off of Bayern. I, I appreciate that one because I'm. I am terrified of that. Uh, I'm going to go with a 2-0 defeat with Bayern. Uh, man, you know, they enter need three points against Torino, but Ivan Juric is a, is a tough bastard. And I will, unfortunately, without Lukaku being in the lineup another week, I'm going to say a draw. I'll say 1-1. Um, but I, I could see a world for sure in which they got out a 1-0 win here. Uh, but I'll, I'll say 1-1. 
Uh, Jake? <laughs> I might as well move to Dallas at this point because uh, I'm literally absolutely on the same I got room in the, I got room in my guest bedroom, <laughs> Jake. Come on in, brother. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. I, I think Inch will struggle to break Bayern down. I think Bayern score early. Uh, I'm just going to hide behind the count for the rest of the game because it's going to be a tough watch. Uh, I think Inch will manage to keep it down. So I think 2-0. Uh, and I think the Trino game will be a horrible game. I think if it was at home, I'd be slightly more confident. I think the fact that it's away... You know, into last season when they lost to Dow, went on to they were self destruct more for a few weeks. And, you know, like Mike said, without Lukaku, I think he'll be really tough. I think 1 1 as well. Right. Um, let's move on to the part of the show where we pay tribute, rip the piss out of, and criticize someone or something heavily in the world of football, starting with the positivity, which we presented by Mr. Positivity himself, Mr. Mohammed Nasser. He's, he works a lot, he's intelligent. And he surprised uh, people sometimes with his uh, ideas. Not easy to find one person of this uh, qualities. Yeah, one of the few silver linings that we consistently hit upon uh, so far in this uh, episode is uh, Lautaro Martinez and his tra- physical transformation, his clinical transformation, his, uh, his uh, evolving uh, you know, uh, role as a, as a talisman and as a leader of the front line. So I think uh, whether it's a derby or any of the games so far this season, uh, uh, we got to pay our respects to uh, El Toro and give him the first Morati of the week this uh, this season. So uh, Lautaro is uh, my Morati of the week. Mm, nice one. Uh, let's move on to something uh, much more comical. This week's Frog, which we presented by Mr. Jake Small. E clamoroso! Autogol di Ranocchia! Uh, I get all these because they're just silly, uh, mainly because I'm quite a silly person. Uh, one thing, <laughs> that, <laughs> one thing that I do want to mention this week, um, as I was trolling through the internet, look at silly four things. Um, it's only quite close to home for me, actually. I say that probably about two hours away from home. Uh, but Hooters, of course, real controversy uh, in the footballing world this week uh, by sponsoring an under ten boys football team. You have oh, got to be joking. <laughs> Burton Joyce FC of the Nottingham region. Under 10 side now being sponsored by Hooters and the Hooters are absolutely hilarious. I love it. All these young lads <laughs> grinning their faces off next to the Hooters staff. <laughs> this can't be right. This this can't be right. No, this can't be true. This can't. I didn't even know you had Hooters in the UK. Yeah, uh, there's one in Nottingham. Uh, and there's one it's America's not- greatest cultural export teams. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but that, the boys are happy about it. I don't know about everybody else. But well, that's- well, that that is that <laughs> that is a frog of the week. Like that, you started really high this season. You're gonna have to like that is fantastic. Right, let's move on to something much more negative. <laughs> this week's Moji, which we presented by Mr. Mike Pilucci. <laughs> So the the season finale last year, I said the emoji of the season was Suning, and I hoped we wouldn't have to do that again. And uh, mm-hmm. lo and behold, you know, for the sake of changing it up, let's just say it's uh, Stephen Zhang in particular. Uh, not because he's, you know, it's singularly his fault, but every time something's going on, Stephen's face is on it. Uh, w- you know, whether it's down to him popping into the locker room uh, after the derby being disappointed, which the freaking nerve to do that after the lack of support of the club to uh, the decree that you can't loan in Francesco Acerbi's moderate wages unless you loan out uh, Luciana Gume and uh, Eddie Salcedo, because that's the point where we're at. And uh, it really just kind of goes to show, you know, Nima brought up a good point about how, you know, for no fault of his own, Samir Hadanovic's legacy is being deemed more and more because he is here past his sell-by date. And, Uh, With every bad performance, people forget the good that he did. Well, that is five times as true for Suning, except Suning has a choice in the matter, right? Mm. You know, Suning can sell. Suning needs to sell. If you can't loan in a 34-year-old center back without worrying about your wages and having to fight with your coach, you should not own a Serie C team, much less one of the European powers in the world. Uh, And it 
absolutely sucks because, as we've all talked about, Suning is responsible for the highs of this era. Suning saved them from the Eric Thohir era. But what we are in now is Eric Thohir to the max. That's where we're at now. And every month that passes, every point that is dropped, every shortcoming, every failure, it all goes back to Suning. It will just make everybody angrier and more sad, myself included, because I don't like thinking about the ownership failures at the start of the season. I'm not as happy as I am at the start of the season, the way I happened the last two years, because I kind of just dread, you know, which thing in this squad that is falling apart is going to fall apart next because Suning is still here and won't just do the right thing and turn this club over. And I don't know what the end point is. I keep thinking they're going to run out of enough money that sooner or later Oak Tree takes control or somebody or they just come to the senses and cash out. But I also would have thought this would have happened by now. So until this happens and until we could just focus on football and on this club being what it should be and what Suning did make it into for a point in time, it's going to be Suning. You know, I'm sure there'll be other weeks where I point the finger at somebody in particular, but this week it's it's Suning. I'm sorry. Sorry, Stephen. Have fun partying wherever you party in the world these days. Uh, I think no one can disagree with that. Um, absolutely. Reverend Mike, ladies and gents. That was all we had time for this week. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you, Mo. Good to have you back again. It's uh, very nice to be back. Thank you guys for having me on. What a great uh, start to the season of the 20th star, the 20th, uh, second star. Ah, from your mouth to God's ears, Mo. Mr. Jake Smalley. Yeah, I'm just currently looking at Google Maps, see how long it might take me to get to Nottingham Hooters. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm going to sign off pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah great to be back. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mike Fiolucci. Good to be back, fellas. Here's hoping Mo's wildest dreams about this club come true. And uh, Forza Inter, like always. Absolutely. And I, my name is Nima Tavali Rutsari, wishing you a good week. Stay safe, take care of each other and yourselves. And sempre e solo Forza Inter.